You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, As always, uh, remember to like and share our episodes and hit that subscribe button. In fact, uh, we were recently at the International Conference on Creationism. where We met some of our listeners, and I know that some of you who are regular listeners or viewers of this podcast, have not actually become subscribers um, because you told me that. You haven't actually hit the subscribe button. So I think you should hit that subscribe button right now. Do it now. Just stop uh, (laughs) stop what you're doing and click the – and and you know what? Do us a favor. Click that bell too. That'll help us out. And I'm sorry if it makes your Uh, phone rattle, but you should do it anyway because it helps us. That's that's quite right. So now some of you might be wondering, is this another one of those kind of trick episodes where, you know, I <laughs> pretend to be here in the UK yeah. and then turn He's really up lurking cabin. right here in the, in the off, off camera now. Right not. OK, but uh, it is not. I, I am I am back in the UK uh, after the ICC. Uh, we have got more to come from the stuff that we recorded when I was in the States. But it's quite complex and it needs more post-production. So that is coming. It will be coming very soon. But what we decided to do is to record uh, some other normal episodes, um, you know, here on Zoom while that sort of complicated editing process goes on. So, uh, yeah. So while that um, while that happens, we decided that we would pick up again on one of our intermittent series. You know, we've got these various series running and one of them is a series on a lot of them and one of them (laughs) is on biblical chronology and uh, you may remember that some time ago we had henry smith from associates for biblical research on to talk to us about the septuagint uh and we ourselves and also i know some of our listeners and viewers were very keen that we sort of looked at the other side of this issue which is to look at the um the traditional hebrew text the the the, the masoretic text uh, we've we've kind of done this out of order uh i i guess i guess we probably ought to have started with the masoretic text and moved on to the septuagint but anyway yeah. hey that's just how it worked out that was <laughs> that was how our guests kind of uh you know fell out in the schedule so uh so anyway so what we're going to do at this time is talk about the masoretic text the hebrew text We're not going to get into too much detail, I think, about what the Masoretic says about the genealogies, which is really the topic of this series. What we wanted to do here is to set the scene by talking about the Masoretic itself. What is the Masoretic text? And and sort of so we 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 kind of understand that a bit a bit like we did with the Septuagint. And then that will prepare the way for future episodes where we'll then dig into more of the chronological information. So as before, Todd and I are no experts in this area, and so we decided to bring on someone who knows far more than we do about this topic, uh, and that is Dr. Doug Smith. So, Doug, we are very pleased to have you with us. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to be on. Yeah. And and this is newly minted Dr. Smith. I think you've just turned in your dissertation and got your finished your degree as well. Is that right? Yes, just defended this summer and uh, some minor corrections, and uh, I don't know where it's gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, our, yeah, our newly minted Dr. Dr. Smith. And it's not the first time you've been on the podcast because I think Todd did interview you with Steve Boyd some time ago where you were talking about some research you'd presented at the Origins meeting. Um, but this yes. is the first time we've done a whole episode um, with you. So, we are, we are really pleased to, to have you on. Doug, for, for those listeners who you know may not be familiar with you just tell us a bit about your background and uh you know what your phd was about and and you know what you're doing currently just tell us a bit about that sure well i come with all kinds of backgrounds and, and interests was a history major did some church music stuff and then uh went for uh theological studies and did my uh, master of divinity and uh, thm at midwestern seminary and then i uh, went to columbia international university for my doctorate and studied there under Dr. Ben Noonan as my supervisor, and uh, Dr. Steve Boyd and Dr. Peter Gentry were my external examiners, and I did a discourse analysis project where I compared 
certain linguistic features of the Hebrew text, uh, the Masoretic text of the flood account with the Greek Septuagint to kind of see, you know, what, what was going on there uh, with that particular corpus. And I uh, just had a lot of fun digging into that, trying to do some interdisciplinary work with uh, um, the meeting of linguistics with biblical studies. Hmm. So it sounds as if you have a great background to talk to us about the topic, you know, today. Um, but I, I think we should probably start with some pretty basic questions. Okay. So, yeah. so <laughs> what is <laughs> what is the original language of the Old Testament, and what is that language like? I mean, how similar is it to the Greek of the Septuagint, which we were talking about with um, with uh, 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 Henry Smith last time? Uh, how different is it from, say, the Indo-European languages like, you know, English and so on? How how does it compare? Sure. Uh, well, Hebrew is your dominant language for Old Testament studies. Uh, a portion of uh, the Bible is in Aramaic in the Old Testament, Daniel and Ezra, and then a, a verse in Jeremiah. And uh, one little thing that um, that Laban says to Jacob in Genesis but by and large, uh, you're dealing with Hebrew, but Hebrew and Aramaic are cognate languages, and they share a lot of features in common. And it is a very different uh, family of languages than uh, Greek, for instance, which comes from more of an Indo-European background. With Hebrew, you're talking about more of an Afro-Asiatic background. And when you compare the translation, for example, of the Septuagint with the Masoretic text, you'll see at times there will be more um, clauses that'll have two be verbs, for instance, whereas in Hebrew, you don't have to, to say that. You say, basically, Noah, a righteous man. Uh, but in English, we'd translate that with Noah was a righteous man. In Greek, uh, sometimes will be verbless, but sometimes it will add that, especially a to be verb and so forth. Greek has more specificity for marking the cases. Uh, so if somebody's ever studied Latin, they'll, they'll learn about the declensions. We have remnants of that in English because of he and him and she and her and who and whom, but by and large, we've we've lost that and don't recognize that in English, and many of us have trouble keeping that straight if it's who or whom and and so forth. Um, Hebrew has more of an economy of words at times, uh, whereas Greek will have a, a bit more variety in how it may translate some things. But on the other side of that, because some people will say, oh, Greek is a much more specific language than Hebrew. Not always. Uh, Hebrew can inflect, for example, verbs with uh, gender, with masculine or feminine, whereas Greek doesn't do that. So when you have a Hebrew verb with the feminine, it's a lot more specific than what you can convey in the Greek. So there's a lot of things that between languages you can bring across and match, but with any languages, unless it's just really close cognate, you're going to have some mismatch and you're just going to have some features that get lost in translation. Right. And how close is the biblical Hebrew to, say, modern Hebrew? I mean, presumably that's that's ancient Hebrew behind you. Is that right? On your that is on your screen there. Yes, that's a page from the Leningrad Codex from Ecclesiastes three. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that. Uh, we talk about yeah. the spacing. There's some cool stuff. But yeah, that's a great question. Biblical Hebrew and modern Hebrew. I've studied biblical Hebrew um, in uh, an academic setting. I've delved into modern Hebrew a bit. There's a lot of overlap, but they are not not uh, quite identical. For example, modern Hebrew is modern. You're going to have words like telephone uh, that uh, come right over. They have a lot of loan words from English and, and other things. Uh, the word order is a little different from biblical Hebrew, but it's, it's fascinating uh, to read about the history of modern Hebrew because the architects, uh, when Israel adopted that as, you know, this is going to be our official language, the architects of that were top biblical scholars as well. And so biblical Hebrew ended up having an influence on it. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So it's a completely different alphabet. I can see that just from looking at the. the oh, yeah. I should have brought that up. Yes. Behind <laughs> you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And it, it reads backwards. Yeah. It reads right to left, or maybe we read backwards. Up, but... up the page, or, does it, or do you read it down the page? No, no, you read down the page, but okay. you do read right to left. Okay. 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 That's yeah. like driving on the wrong side of the road, Paul. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly we exactly. experienced that this summer <laughs> yeah that's that's very weird because it affects the layout of when hebrew text is written in a book absolutely you kind of read from the what from we would think cover. of as the back of the book to yeah the, to the yes yeah, uh, yeah. and 
And it really uh, shows up when you see people that don't know that Hebrew reads right to left and you you see them spell something out left to right. I saw some uh, Emmanuel <laughs> in a Bible study video one time. I thought, what's, I don't know that Hebrew word. Then I thought, let's read it the other way. Oh, it's Emmanuel. They just put it the wrong direction. So. <laughs> And I should also mention the consonants, uh, the written biblical Hebrew in the ancient times, uh, as well as modern Hebrew. If you open up uh, Haaretz or the Jerusalem Post or one of the newspapers today, there's no vowels. Uh, they, there are some consonants that hint at it, but there are there are no vowel, distinct vowel letters. And that's another major difference between this and Indo-European languages. OK, so I could I could see that being really confusing when you yeah. when you're reading the text, because I can think of words, say, in English, mm -hmm. where if you took the vowels out and you only had the consonants, it you could actually have some choices about what that word is. Yeah, um, but... So, you know, how is that dealt with in, in the Hebrew text? Do they have ways of letting you know? <laughs> right. Uh, that's a great question. Yes, there are some uh, consonant letters. They call them. Uh... Matris lexionis in uh, some of the ancient texts where they'll have uh, a vav or a yod. And when you see those, it would be like if you had uh, English words without vowels, but you had a Y there, for instance, you would think, okay, there, there may be a vowel sound that's that's going to occur there and so forth. And context is part of it too. It, it is true that with just consonants, there are some ambiguities, uh, but context will usually determine, okay, this is this kind of verb, or this is a noun here, obviously, it's the subject and the clause or whatever. So this sounds yeah. I mean, very unfamiliar to, yeah. to, to me. I, I, I don't know much about languages, but this, yeah, this is really unfamiliar territory. And um, t tell us a bit about the history of Hebrew. You You talked about the kind of cognate languages, but What's the history of Hebrew? Do, do we know anything much about that? Sure. Well, there, there's some different views about linguistic origins and things like that. But uh, some people would argue that it developed from some sort of proto-Canaanite language and that the written form uh, may derive, for example, back to uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and, and come through some whole paths there. Uh, but the alphabet itself, uh, you know, the Phoenician and, and these other languages, there's some relation with all this. But the alphabet is one of the major technological educational breakthroughs that, that ever happened, because you have other regions uh, surrounding that uh, Akkadian, for instance, which um, Babylon would, would have that. You've got, I think, 600 and some different cuneiform signs. And you would have to be, I guess, very well educated, whereas you got 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's it's not really that hard. And some of the, the texts in the Hebrew Bible make use of that, too, and as memory devices by having acrostics you could go down through. Right, sure. So some of the Psalms are like that. I, yes. Yeah. You know, so they're the kind of acrostics. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, that's that's very helpful. So when we talk about this Hebrew text, you know, we, we, we have this expression, which I think I used at the beginning of the, the program, where we talk about the Masoretic text um but what exactly is the masoretic text what what do we mean by that i mean what does that word mean and where, where does that come from right well it depends on uh, whom you're asking but i'll give you some like the top <laughs> probably the top three the top three <laughs> okay so I, i've actually seen this in church statements of faith I've, I've seen church statements of faith say we use this english version and, and we only accept the masoretic hebrew text as as uh, an original language text for the old testament and what they may be meaning is the Masoretic text that many would also call the Second Rabbinic Bible. Um, sometimes you'll see it referred to as the Mikra Gedola, or the Big Bible. And uh, it actually became kind of a standard for the Rabbinic versions of the Bible later. It has all kinds of commentary around the text, and it is a synthesis of Masoretic manuscripts, which I'll define more closely here in a moment, uh, with uh, the reading of the text and also the notes around it. That was produced in 1524, 1525 in Venice by Daniel Bomberg, a Christian who hired a Jew, uh, Jacob ben Chaim ibn Adonijah, I believe is his name. And he was the one who proofread and, and did all the hard Hebrew work for this Christian printer. And this is basically the Old Testament of the Reformation. So most of our English Bibles are going to be primarily based upon this and that's what some people refer to as the masoretic text as far as one official version of it but we could use it in a different sense um, masoretic scholar ej revel defined it uh, in a widest sense as any text of the hebrew bible produced under the the care of scholars 
known as Masoretes or any copy of the text like that that includes the not just the the, the Masoretic text is more than consonants. Our older copies of the Hebrew Bible have just consonants, but it includes vowels. It includes accents that show the stress on a word or which words group together or separate. Also, how it was chanted, uh, and then additional notes in the margins. And uh, another scholar just identifies Masoretic text as any uh, any codex that that's basically an ancient form of a book rather than a scroll that has these marginal annotations that are known as the as the Mazora. And Mazora means um, either tradition, something that's handed over, or something that's bound. Again, depending on whom you ask, but you can kind of see how either would work with this. This is either a tradition that's been handed down, and you can see that in the writings, or you could think, okay, these are things that we bind up with the text to help uh, people preserve the correct reading. Hmm. You mentioned there um, the this group of scribes, the, yes. the Masoretes. Yes. Um, t- tell us a bit about the Masoretes. So, so when were they um, doing this kind of textual work, this this copy yes. of the text? Yes, the Masoretes uh, are a group of, as you said, scribes and scholars who were active roughly 500 to 1,000, or some people narrow it to about 600 A.D. to 950 A.D. Now, they are building off the work of of prior scholars uh, before the Masoretic period. Uh, The Rabbinic period uh, has been flourishing in different ways. The, The Talmud uh, is being collected this the oral law is being written down uh, to be preserved and uh, you're also going to get along with the masoretic period the targums you're going to get the in aramaic these translations slash paraphrases of the text that are going along with this so all this is kind of converging but the masoretes see themselves as preserving this ancient tradition uh, where the rabbis have collected and preserved the text and tried to uh, copy it exactly and uh, they go back, uh, as I mentioned, um, to about 500 or 600, depending on whom you ask. But they, they will trace their lineage. They will, they will even talk about certain scholars from that era. But you come down, the most famous uh, is called uh, Ben Asher. And uh, Ben Asher, and uh, there's another tradition called the Ben Naftali tradition. And these traditions are, are somewhat in competition, but there's not a whole lot of difference. It's very minute. I was looking at one like it's whether you pronounce Issachar, like, is isoshkar or ishashkar things like that very minor differences that they're they're dealing with here but they um i should also add uh their geography because uh, we have to go back to you know you've got the fall of jerusalem in ad 70 the destruction of the temple major event in judaism you've got the bar kokba rebellion in 135 and there's this expulsion of jews from jerusalem you've got a developing christian presence in palestine and some Jewish scholars are working from there at first, but ironically, they end up moving many of them back to Babylon. You know, we'd had the Babylonian exile there in 586 BC, but here, you know, in the AD period, after the Bar Kokhba rebellion and the, the, the years after this, they're moving to Babylon and developing some things. But then you've got this amazing golden age of learning this, uh, with, with these, this Islamic regime. And they allow the settlement at Tiberias on the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. And that's where these final Masoretes do their work. And they produce a very intricate system that kind of subsumes the others and takes over. And that's um, that's the work that gets continued. So let me ask you this, because uh, <laughs> I'm learning a lot from this conversation. This is fascinating. Um, so Masoretes are f- uh, 500 years after Jesus birth yes basically so yes. they're not from the time of say the kingdom period uh the divided kingdom or the the unified kingdom they're considerably later yes is <laughs> and and we talk about oh what does the masoretic text say about the the chronologies but is it even fair to use that is it anachronistic to call, to say this is a Masoretic text if it's not even if it's from before, say if it's a Dead Sea Scroll? Is that can that, can we right. really legitimately call that Masoretic? Right. Um, yeah, it is anachronistic, and you'll see that okay. in the literature at times. <laughs> I, I saw one where they were talking about somebody and and what they were trying to do in the the second century with the Masoretic text. I'm like, well, you know, it's not quite that developed uh okay. what's going on yet so some will call these uh prior streams or this prior stream the 
proto MT and that you okay. have basically the consonantal text that the the Masoretes are going to preserve this ancient tradition the vowels and the pronunciation and the phrasing even the the way we group our words together is part of this too and they're going to codify this and preserve this in writing so people don't lose it and change it later okay but then yeah. so, so i've heard the word proto mt i've heard the word proto masoretic before and i yes. never really quite understood that but it's basically it's basically, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to say this right. Is it, is it kind of, it's the same wording that is present in the Masoretic later, but it's just vowel-less and, and just the consonants? Is that basically what it would be? I believe there's a strong case for that. Yeah, okay. All right. Mm. Mm. Good enough. <laughs> so yeah, proto-Masoretic uh, yeah, so is what I'm, we should talk about. Proto-Masoretic. Sorry, Paul, go on. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying to get this sort of time timeline in you know straight in my head. So you so you got the Masoretes who are kind of did you say about five hundred to a thousand, and they're they're um there's this kind of standardized Hebrew text, and that they've got all of these annotations and vowel pointing and all of this kind of stuff. So that helps you sort of understand the text, but they're doing all of that work on a textual tradition that has a much longer history. Yes. Um, at, so when we look at, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are obviously considerably earlier than this period that you're talking about with the Masoretes, yes. how close is, that, it, is the text that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls yes. to what we see the Masoretes working on? And, you know... I, is there is there a uniform text at the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right. That's a great question. When you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a variety of things that, that you can find. There's commentaries in there. There's some very sectarian documents like the the, the war scroll about the, the sons of darkness and the sons of light and so forth that aren't necessarily biblical. But there are these biblical commentaries, biblical texts, but they're not all equal. They're not all even. Uh, one of them's been described basically as a, a scribe boy's homework. <laughs> and you can see where, you know, imagine a student trying to, you know, copy Hebrew text across the page and they don't anticipate the margin coming up quickly enough. And all of a sudden the letters start getting smaller or one trails off or, or things like <laughs> that. Funny. And they're not all of even quality. There appear to be some personal copies of things. Like if you or I kept a diary and wanted to write our favorite Psalms. Or if we were making notes for a sermon or something like that, maybe we rearrange the text in a different order to make our points. There's some of that, but there's um, some people have done different studies, and it kind of depends on how they're looking at the textual history. But one I saw had a, a great number aligned with the Masoretic text, and then a great number that they called non-aligned, independent. They don't quite fit with anything, but I think a lot of these other uses, uh, other use cases for copying the scripture explain a lot of that. But uh, I remember seeing the the En Gedi scroll, um, you know, from the region, uh, when they un unrolled that a few years ago digitally, it had been charred. And it, you know, was remarkably corresponding with the Masoretic text of Leviticus, although this is was clearly, you know, much older than the witnesses that we have with the Masoretes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've I've got here my um this is a little King James Bible so this is a little authorized version which the Old Testament is basically based on the that Masoretic text um and I guess the question that people have in their minds is you know when we pick up our modern English translation here uh, if you've got this history of copying and you know you've got the Masoretes who are you know are then working on a manuscript tradition that goes back a lot further goes back you know to those original manuscripts um and there's been this long history of copying how certain are we that what we're reading in our modern english translation reflects those original manuscripts because you know we we have these statements don't we in our in in, in our statements of faith where we talk about the inspiration of the scriptures mm -hmm. but we believe that it's the original autographs that are inspired the original right. autographs of scripture and we don't have those right? we don't have those right. original autographs so how confident can i be that what i'm reading here has been transmitted um uh, faithfully down down through all of that long period right 
Well, here I would say when it comes to arguments, I, I can I can believe what I think is a strong argument here, but ultimately this is going to come down to faith. And I believe the words of our Lord Jesus when he said the scripture cannot be broken, and when he said that not one jot or tittle of the law would pass away, and, and so forth. But when I look at the textual history and the evidence that I've seen and the, the scholarship I've seen on it, I'm just very encouraged because, for example, what we talked about with certain Dead Sea Scroll evidence matching the later Masoretic text so closely, and the Masoretes' work themselves, uh, these guys, even when there were variants, what I see in the text is they'll make a note of it rather than deleting it. They'll keep that as part of the history of copying, and they'll say, okay, this should be read this way, but we are going to keep this right here. And uh, the care with which they preserved it, I, I think, is just a great testimony, and, and you can see that in the notes. Uh, these notes uh, will indicate, for example, if you've got what we call a hapax legomenon, where you have a word that occurs one time, for instance, like with, with gopher, with gopher wood uh, in, in the account of the flood. You know, there'll be a little note out to the side with the lamed, uh, which stands for a word that means alone, like this is the only instance of this. And uh, wow. they have these internal concordances in the beginning, uh, Bereshit. It'll say, okay, this occurs five other times, and you can find it in, in Kings, and here's where this occurs. So this this type wow. of care uh, just uh, amazes me and gives me a lot of confidence that we have what God breathed out. And this is mm. this is handwritten copies of stuff. Yes. They don't have computer cross-referencing. That's right. They don't have printing presses. They're just going through and counting these words basically yes. by hand and, and cataloging yes. it in some way. That's astonishing to me. Yes. <laughs> and even yeah. putting the statistics, uh, that's one feature of the Masoretic text I didn't mention earlier. There's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, it will give you the statistics at the end of sections uh, like of the Torah or the Minor Prophets, uh, the 12, or at the end of a book. And it'll tell you, you know, how many words are in the book? How, how many, I mean, what's the middle letter? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine the painstaking <laughs> <Right>. effort <Wow. laughs> to find that and then to be able to check it? Yeah, that, I mean, this is this is remarkable. So these guys are really, really meticulous in how they're handling the text. Yes, because they're handling it because of what it is. You know, it's the yes. word of God. So they're they're handling it with this enormous care. Uh, but you're also right to emphasize, I think. This idea that God has not only inspired the text, but He's preserved the text. Yes, um, you know that, and and we see that reflected. I know in some of the com great confessions of faith that that God has not only inspired His Word, but He's actually preserved it, so that we we can be confident that what we have today reflects what was in those original inspired manuscripts. And yes, um, and we see, you know, God often works through means, and one of the means that He's used is this incredible care that the Masoretes. And other yes. scribes took in transmitting the, the text. So that, that's very helpful. So what are the oldest? I mean, let's think about sort of dating here. So what are some of the oldest Masoretic manuscripts that we have? Can, can you talk about those? Because you, you mentioned, I think, this Leningrad yes. Codex. That's the one behind you, I think right. you said. Yes. Is that one... <laughs> I understand that's one of the oldest. Is that is that correct? It's one of the oldest. It's not the oldest, but it's the oldest complete. We we have some manuscripts okay. from you know maybe 150, 200 years before that that are in uh, the Tiberian Masoretic tradition. As I mentioned earlier, there's the Palestinian Babylonian traditions, which they're a little different. They write the vowels uh, usually over the letters, whereas uh, the Tiberian tradition uses under and sometimes over and beside. But uh, yeah, the uh, Leningrad Codex goes to 1009 AD. There is an older version that uh, in Jewish history, they've referred to this as the crown. It's the Aleppo Codex. It goes back to about 930 AD. But sadly, much of it was destroyed in anti-Jewish riots in 1947-48. Uh, and uh, so we're basically missing, you know, the, the bulk of the Pentateuch there, which uh, is a Genesis guy. I, you know, it's like, oh, I wish we had the Genesis of the Aleppo Codex <laughs> yeah. because it's supposed to be the most accurate uh, manuscript. But the Leningrad Codex is very close to it, the same scribal tradition. And, uh, you know, even though it is a, a thousand years old, uh, I think we've got pretty good reason to think they've, they've done a good job handling the text along the way. And then there are... I you said these are the most complete 
lots of early manuscripts, but get, I guess there's fragmentary evidence that goes back earlier than that. So. Yes. But yeah. uh, Leningrad was not, not even discovered until the mid-1800s. And so when you're talking oh, wow. about the Masoretic text of, of Bomberg and Ben Chaim, you know, he didn't have that. He had some 12th century manuscripts he was collating and working with. But uh, to even go back beyond that and find things that are in agreement with what he had done, it's just a, a great testimony. Yeah. Okay, well, Todd, I don't know if you've got any other questions about sort of the Masoretic text itself and the history, um, but I was going to sort of move on in a moment to sort of zoom in on Genesis, yeah. but I just wanted to say, is no, there anything else you wanted to ask? Let's so, let's talk uh, Pentateuch and Genesis. What? Yeah, sure. What should we know about that? <laughs> Yeah. yeah now, pen- kick, kick us off. What, what should yeah, we the, What should we know about the, uh, particularly the Genesis text um, yeah. in, in the Masoretic? Right. Well, here again, you can go back and compare with uh, some Dead Sea Scroll evidence. Now, we don't have um, we don't have a ton. Genesis just does not do well, especially yes. the early chapters when it comes right. to being preserved right. in manuscripts. I mean, I think about uh, we. At, I teach uh, full time at a Christian school, and we gave students some paperback Bibles years ago. Don't you know, by the end of the school year, some of them were missing part of Genesis. <laughs> and so uh, we have some fragmentary evidence, but I know uh, Dr. Jeremy Lyons done some work on the flood account and the creation account. And one of the really cool things is the spacing. And the Masoretes are preserving the spacing, uh, the sense divisions that'll start a new line or, or give us a gap between sections to indicate there's either a new section or we're going to emphasize this. And the days of creation is a, a great example of that. After every day of creation, first day, second day, third day, it starts a new line. And that, that can't be an accident. And to see that come back together, that's, that, that's amazing. But again, as I said, it's, it is fragmentary. Uh, the flood account, I wish we had a lot more of it to compare, um, but uh, there are just a, a lot of good indications, though, that the Pentateuch especially has, had been dealt with very special attention. There are some uh, archaic forms of Hebrew that are preserved in the Masoretic text that we'll find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the the third person uh, independent pronoun. Uh, Hebrew is a lot of fun when you learn this because who is he? And you can. There's this whole Abbott and Costello uh, adaptation that you yeah. can can go off on. Who is he? And he is. And he is she in Hebrew, uh, with the the way the the independent pronouns sound. But the feminine uh, and the masculine uh, in parts of the Pentateuch that they are the same, and that's an archaism in the the transmission of Hebrew. But you see it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. You see it in the Masoretic text in the Pentateuch. And that's a pretty amazing correspondence uh, that we see there. And then you've got the copying. Uh, th- there's there's evidence, for example, Maimonides, which talk about interdisciplinary knowledge here. You know, here's a, a Jewish physician who's also <laughs> a scholar, and he's copying his own Torah scroll from a Masoretic manuscript, from the Aleppo Codex, he says. And the Torah scrolls don't have vowels. They don't have all these extra markings, but the formatting, the spacing is the same. And so he he saw it as very reliable. Wow. Yeah, and our our viewers and listeners um, might remember that we actually did a couple of episodes with um, Jeremy Lyon, uh, who, who you just mentioned there. We we yes. were talking to him about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and uh, and and in particular uh, the way they they recorded the the Genesis creation account and the flood account. So yeah, go go back and have a look in the archive, and you'll yes. you'll find those episodes as well if you're interested in in sort of digging into that a bit more. Um, yeah. So, so thinking then about the, um, the Pentateuch and obviously particularly, uh, Genesis. And of course we want to focus on those first 11 chapters because that's where the genealogies are that we're, we're, we're particularly interested. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of get your views about the way that the text came together because Many people will be familiar with this view that's been very common in uh, scholarly circles that um, Genesis and the Pentateuch more generally is this kind of patchwork of what were once originally separate independent sources uh, that were probably written maybe quite late and certainly edited, redacted, um, you know, to form this kind of this this text that we currently have uh this kind of patchwork quilt of 
uh, documents that have been brought together. Um, people may know this term, the documentary hypothesis, and sort of be somewhat familiar with that. Um, what What's your view about all of that, and and particularly the kind of textual basis for the documentary kind of idea? Right. Well, the documentary hypothesis is a fairly recent idea, and in some ways it's based on some very... Um, I'm not saying it's insignificant, but some some very superficial factors, the the usage of divine names, for instance, you have Elohim as your general term for God. You have Yahweh as your covenant name of the Lord. And some will look at the text in the Pentateuch and in Genesis in particular, and they'll say, okay, you know, here in the flood account, it's the here's the Yahwehist uh, editor or redactor or scribe. And here's the the Elohist because there's different names from God. So it's clearly, uh, different scribes. You have duplications that occur in the text is another major factor for the documentary hypothesis. So you've got um, Abraham um, saying, uh, passing off Sarah as his sister more than once. And then you've got Isaac doing that same kind of thing. So the idea would be, well, obviously, you know, somebody uh, just pieced these together. They were just different traditions about Abraham. But and I want to say this respectfully to to the scholars that uh, you know in certain ways are you know studied more many more languages than I have and so forth. But I think they're staring way too closely at the tree. Uh, that they're way too close, and they need to back up and look at the bigger picture. And I don't think uh, any more than if I were to open a book from some foreign language I don't know and start staring at a word and picking out some things. I, I've got to learn a lot more about how the language works, and I think. The advances in Hebrew language and linguistics, uh, I would like to think that this might not have become as widely accepted if we had had some of those advances, but it is a growing discipline, and, and it's grown in the last you know centuries uh, for people, especially English scholars, English-speaking scholars, to understand how Hebrew literature works, because it's different from our Indo-European traditions and our classical uh, Greco-Roman traditions. And it's different from how many of us were instructed that repetition is bad in English class. You don't want to repeat yourself. That's the opposite of biblical Hebrew. You do want to repeat yourself. And you want to go around, um, Dr. Gentry, I think, helpfully compared it to uh, your stereo system. Uh, you know, you've got your left speaker and your right speaker. It's the same song, but you're going to hear different instruments. It's going to do different things. And at times, it's more like the 7.1 Dolby uh, in what it's doing. So I, I think the documentary hypothesis fundamentally misunderstands how Hebrew literature works. It doesn't understand that you need the repetition to bring out different angles, and different points, like an instant replay in sports or a flashback in a novel or a movie. Uh, and uh, with the the evidence they're finding too, Hebrews aren't the only cultures that you know may alternate between a generic name for deity and a specific name. So it shouldn't be a surprise that we have Elohim and Yahweh. So I, I just don't think they're they're reading the text um, with enough care to, to be able to sustain that uh, view. And I think it's fair to say, um, at least based on my limited and superficial sort of understanding of this topic, some of the more naive kind of documentary style hypothesis has given way recently it's kind of been a bit discredited and people are thinking in more sophisticated ways about the text it's you know some of that those early ideas of yes yes um, it's de yeah de it's definitely been refined and there's there's different variations of it but but even some scholars who wouldn't have say a conservative evangelical view of scripture either reject it or just sidestep it they say okay i'll assume that but i have to take the text as it is not some hypothetical reconstruction that we don't have Right. And when you say we don't have um, this kind of hypothetical text, I mean, I, I, I guess the question, you know, in, in the back of our minds is, you know, are, are there versions of the text, sort of older versions of the text that are different than the text we currently have that maybe have chunks of the text missing, you know, chap chapters missing, particular stories missing or uh, things in a different order you know because if there's been this sort of long process of mm -hmm. editing of different sources right you know i kind of i i guess i'd sort of expect to see some of that do do we see right. that in the i, I, I may be missing history? something but i'm not aware of anything that would would support that um there are some interesting uh, features in some of the the findings with the older scrolls where they will sometimes write yahweh with a paleo hebrew script in the midst of a 
the Babylonian, because the, the, the text behind me here, this is, this is because of the Babylonian exile, <laughs> you know, there, there's this paleo Hebrew script that's very different before, uh, and that's a lot better for inscriptions, but uh, you'll have a text copied in a script like this, but have this paleo Hebrew for the divine name, or even in Greek manuscripts, they'll wow. write it with the paleo Hebrew at times, wow. but I'm not aware of anything text wise, I may be missing something, but I'm not aware of anything that would lend strong support to the documentary hypothesis and the textual history. So when did that change? When did that change happen? I mean, paleo Hebrew to this, this block form you're showing there, when, when did they start doing that it, during the captivity? Is that when it happened? Uh, I think that's a, a good, good guess. Uh, I don't know that we know a hundred percent for sure, but I, but I think, you know, coming back the, the Aramaic square script, uh, it's, you know, maybe even, you know, some think Ezra standardized the, te the text and, and maybe yeah. he did. Yeah. Uh, and it would make a lot of sense to use that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting because if, if you do see those random bits of, of the divine name in paleo Hebrew, that would suggest that they were originally copying it in paleo Hebrew, that, they, yes. that there is some memory there that. This is the real divine name that we are not to take in vain, and we're not even going to put it in any other alphabet except the original that it was written in. Right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm too much of a scientist here, but that sounds like <laughs> evidence that it was originally written in Paleo Hebrew <laughs> before the exile. Yeah. 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 And I get. I it, what we've talked about this before. I think when we talked to. Um, Jeremy, but we were talking about the earliest, uh, the earliest textual evidence we have of Genesis. So, how how far does that go back? Is is that in before the Dead Sea Scrolls, or is, do we? Is that the first? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls there? would be the, the earliest evidence for that, Genesis. That's the earliest that we have. Mm -hmm. So, there's still, I, I guess, there's still to be fair to the documentary hypothesis people, that there is a gap between. Sure. When the when the original manuscript was written, those original autographs, and when we have the first textual evidence, so I guess they could they could always sort of say, well, all of that editing and that redacting kind of went on in that period, sure. where we don't have any evidence. But that is a kind of an argument from a lack of evidence yeah. rather than anything that we can right. point. To. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Todd, have you got any other? questions that you, um, you wanted to sort of bring up at this point let me look at my notes to make sure we've covered all here um i've i found this really interesting because oh, i know what <laughs> yeah, i wanted this, to ask this you. is fascinating this, yeah this this is i hear this a lot when i talk when i read creationist literature because yeah i do a lot of that and um sometimes i will hear people talk about the composition of genesis in terms of the original sources that Moses used. So this mm -hmm. is not a fancy documentary hypothesis thing. Right. But Moses, if Moses is writing this down during his lifetime, he is writing what? 3000 years, maybe after creation, uh, at least a millennium after the flood. Um, so, there's the question there. Is he just, is he just, I, I guess the, the simple naive idea would be that he just took dictation. God said, here, pick up a pen and paper and write this down. I'm going to write down exactly what I tell you. Uh, so that's sort of the, the simplistic idea. But I do hear a lot of creationists talking about, you know, what did Moses use? Where did, how did Moses find out about Adam and Eve? And how did Moses find out about Noah? And are those things, I guess that's still entirely based on the little the little yeah. self-contained stories that we have in Genesis but is that is that on the same par of objectionableness <laughs> as as say the 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 more speculative documentary hypothesis or, or do you think there's something to any of that is it yeah, is I, it just speculation I think there's there's definitely a speculative element, but I don't think it's the same type of speculation. Um, and I know when I've mentioned something like this, some people automatically thought I was talking about the documentary hypothesis. I'm like, no, 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 no. Uh, some thinks that Moses, uh, you know, being with the the Levites, uh, with with that that tribe, that even before they were designated to do the things they were with the temple, the tabernacle service, and so forth, that 
they had kept the records. Maybe, you know, the scripture is not really explicit about something like that. Uh, did Moses, uh, you know, did he receive from his parents some of these things? Uh, perhaps, uh, but uh, we know that the text tells us that he received divine revelation. It's mm -hmm. plausible that God revealed many things uh, to him there, but I see it as also plausible that it's a combination that he did that and also learned some things or perhaps adapted some things or perhaps used the format of certain writings or traditions as a foil to say, basically, this is what we were taught in Egypt, or this is what they're saying over in uh, in mm -hmm. Mesopotamia, but this is uh, the real deal. This right. is how God really created things. Right. And so, you know, not mentioning the sun. <laughs> and, right, uh, yes. Right. And, and, Genesis, and coming out of a place. Right, in Genesis 1, yes. the, as I understand it, and help me out here, the, the Hebrew word for sun is also a word that would be used for the god of the sun i guess and so that's not even present he just calls it the greater right. light is that have i got yes, that story yes, right yes yeah. yes so, i believe so yes so god and, is uh, so powerful that he doesn't even name pagan gods he's just right. it's just the the greater light right. and the lesser light and so forth so yes okay and there's these uh snippets of poetry that are found uh, in the pentateuch and longer poems that are found there as well and you know it, it may be that he's kind of you know, like we would allude oh, right. to, uh, you know, something like in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue or something right. like that in the midst of a history lesson or document or something. I think he could be doing something like that. I don't know. That's right. It's not a hill to die on for me, but I, I see Moses as having all this training in Pharaoh's court. And uh, it's hard for me to think that he didn't use some of his education, but guided by God, of course. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so then so I'm thinking about the way the Genesis one through 11 is structured. It's got that universal focus that goes beyond yes. just Abraham and his, and his descendants. Um, but it's also pretty episodic. It's covering an mm -hmm. enormous amount of time. Yes. Um, so it's covering 2000 years. Uh, and it's basically got, here's Adam and a little bit of family drama and then some, lists of names and mm -hmm. then Noah and the flood and then some more list of names tower of babel and then here's Abraham's lineage and even if we don't know uh where those all came from other than just the the revelation of god is it fair to sort of treat the stories sort of like little capsules um textual I guess the I guess the word is pericope. Uh, I've, yes. I've heard people I've heard Bible scholars use that word pericope. So um, is that fair? Because because one of the things that I'm really interested in is the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel story mm -hmm. is real short. It's just a couple of yep. verses right at the top of chapter 11. It comes right after this this long list of names in chapter 10, the Table of Nations, and right before another long list of names, which is the genealogy of Abraham. And I've always felt yes. like mm, that that. That, if there was ever a candidate for something that got sort of inserted and dropped into scripture, that would be a good one because it just, it's just sort of, it just sort of, here's a little aside and let me tell you about where all the nations came from. Okay, now we're going to go yes. on and tell you about Abraham. Am I, is that, is that a fair thing to do? Is that something that scholars will do? Will they sort of cut out a capsule and just talk about that little piece? Yes, I mean, and when we say cut out a capsule, it's obviously still connected. It's part of the sure. larger whole, but Absolutely. there is a self-contained. There's a, a textual limit in the Tower of Babel, for instance. It is offset at the beginning and end by Masoretic sense divisions, which shows that at least the Masoretes, and in their tradition, they saw that as being its own kind of thing. And there are some, going back to the documentary hypothesis, another thing that's brought up is contradictions. And there's a way to read a certain Hebrew verb form, the vayiktol form, which is your narrative preterite. It's a very uh, reliable marker overall that you're in narrative. It is not always chronologically uh, sequenced. It, it's a narrative sequence. But just because you have one of those forms that starts the Tower of Babel doesn't mean this happened next. There's there's dyschronologization going on all the time in Hebrew narrative. And right. so I think it, it's perfect to think of it this way and think, okay, this is its own little episode. Let's go back and explain these languages we mentioned in chapter 10. Where'd they come from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So, okay, that, that makes sense to me then. So we could talk also about why Moses or the author there chose to position that particular story Mm -hmm. where he did. But it's not outrageous to think of the story as being sort of its own independent thing that has its own independent rules. I mean, if the Masoretes thought of it that way, then who am I to to argue with the Masoretes, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) But even just uh, analyzing just the the words and the vocabulary and the structure, there's a great, there's a chiasm in that passage and also a parallel panel. How in the world do you create you know, basically this X structure that has s- symmetry, you know, and a hinge at the center, but also be able to line up things side by side. It's it's just amazing. Wow. Yeah. In, fa- in fact, it's interesting you mentioned that chiastic structure because that shows up a lot, you know, yes. <laughs> in the Bible. The, the, the flood account has yes. this kind of chiastic structure. And that's always struck me as very strange if the flood account was, as the documentary hypothesis mm-hmm. would say, kind of cobbled together by lots of independent accounts, you know, that have just been sort of patched together. Um, It would be incredibly difficult to then produce this beautiful chiastic structure by sort of pasting together. You you imagine trying to do that, you know, cutting and pasting, (laughs) you know, lots of different independent source documents and coming up with that sort of structure. So yeah, it's, it it just, yeah, it it seems to me a strike against the documentary hypothesis. So, so yes. a final yeah. note here: can can you give us a verbal explanation of chiasm? Um, <laughs> this is going to be hard because I think of it, I think of it like a flock of of uh, like a flock of geese, right, in their V shape. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of the way I think about it, right. Um, yeah, you could look at it that way. You could look at it as uh, you know, tossing a, a rock into the uh, lake and the and the ripples. It's basically this ring structure, this inverted symmetry, and it tends to have. Uh, some people say it always has to have like an odd element in the middle and everything else out from it. Some say you can converge in the middle and you know just have those two opposites and then go back. But there's there's some kind of reversal that goes on, and it's such an amazing thing in the flood account. It reinforces what's going on there because it all hinges on God remembered Noah, right. and then everything starts unfolding and going back. And where God had destroyed creation, now He's restoring it, and things are going to start over. Wow! Wow! All right. Wow. Well, maybe we'll put a visual yeah. in to help our help our uh, YouTubers uh, figure out what in the world uh, chiasm is, but we'll definitely put yeah, some that would in, probably the, be a good idea. in the show notes. We'll have a link or something that explains what a chiasm is. Yeah. I think we're running out of time here, but this is, this has been uh, really fascinating and I, yeah, I've got lots of other questions <laughs> in, the, in my mind. Um, I, I would love to know whether Noah had you know, documents that he preserved from before the flood on the ark. You know, Me did too. he did he have written accounts? And <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, there's a, there's all kinds of yeah interesting questions. So anyway, we 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 need to sort of wind this up because uh, we're we're running out of time. But thank you so much, um, Doug. That's that's been really helpful. And uh, yeah, we we will definitely be coming back to pick up some of these threads and thinking particularly about the genealogies you know, as we continue this this series on biblical chronology. So stay tuned for that. We don't know when we're going to come back to it, but we will be coming back to it. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, we will see you again, I guess, in, a, in a, another couple of weeks' time. Um, and thank you very much for listening. So we'll see you then. Thanks, Paul and Todd. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.